So, is this on? Yeah. Good day, and uh, yeah, welcome to Unmasking Cyber War, uh, a panel which will look into, I guess, some of the darker sides of how technological infrastructures may be mobilized for uh, military purposes, but also of value extractions, and how we also often as users are complicit or implicit, implicated by such systems. And uh, while this will be much more uh, uh, fully covered by the participants and the introduction also by your moderator, Ryan Bishop, and I'd like to uh, maybe mention some of the credentials of Ryan for also moderating this particular panel among books that he has published are uh, Modernist Avant-Garde Aesthetics and Contemporary Military Technology, Technic Technicities of Perception, together with John Phillips. And also the Cold War, uh, no, the ed co edited <laughs> volume, Cold War Legacies, Systems, Theory, Aesthetics, which was published um, recently with John Beck on Edinburgh University Press. So, Ryan is um, a professor of global art and politics at the Winchester School of Art, uh, an institution which is an important, uh, uh, long running already uh, collaboration partner of Transmediale. And they have also set up a, uh, um, the, archaeology, the AMPT Archaeologists of Media and Technology group that published this little neat office manual, um, Archaeologists of Media and Technology, which you can also find lying around at the festival. And Transmedial is also part of this uh, project. Um, doing more promotion here of all of our activities. We published a reader in 2016, Transmediale Reader Across and Beyond. I, you can, I can also encourage you to check that up, up uh, out in the info counter. But now I'd just like to welcome all the participants of Un Unmasking Cyber War and give them a hand and let's listen to this panel. Thanks a lot, Christopher. And I uh, want to thank Christopher and Daphne Dragona again for all their hard work. And um, let's, let's thank them in the traditional fashion because they work really hard every year to do transmedia. Okay, I have a few very brief comments before we move on to the main attractions. Um, when I was thinking about trying to set up this panel, because it's a really set a diverse set of uh, interesting examinations into infrastructure, uh, that both digital and analog. And I was thinking about the term cyber war, and I went back to Arkea and Ronfeldt, who some of you might know as RAND uh, military uh, theorists, people who um, really connected with the university, critical theory, as well as pop, uh, public discourse. And they're, you might know them from their work on cyber war and then their work on net war. And they also did uh, work on swarming, and, uh, which relates to the work of my colleague and friend, UC Parika, uh, insect media and swarming technologies there. So one of the things that I looked at was their 2001 book, uh, as well as the swarming book, um, which was on net war. And they're beginning to think about net war as an altogether different sort of thing from cyber war. So this is 2001. And one of the reasons I wanted to look at 2001, because for some people who attend uh, Transmediality 2001, is the name of a movie or something that occurs in the distant past. And what I wanted to do was look at some trends that might still be operative in the contemporary moment. Because Arkea and Ronfeldt were incredibly influential in terms of thinking about how uh, information technology was changing warfare. And that they said we needed to radically rethink asymmetric warfare and the necessity of the US military to rapidly alter not only its strategic plans, but their scope for potential enemy combatants from hard weaponry to soft, from blue collar conflict to white collar, from material to software transactions and non-human actors. A few things to note in looking at their summary of net war. One of them is the relation to cyber war with the difference being in their minds that net war is quote, 
the lower intensity societal level counterpart to quote the mostly military concept of cyber war. They continue to assert that net war has a dual nature like the two-faced Roman god Janus and that it is composed of conflicts waged on the one hand by terrorists, criminals, and ethno-nationalist extremists and by civil society activists on the other. What distinguishes net war as a form of conflict is the networked organizational structure for its practitioners with many groups actually being leaderless and the suppleness in their ability to come together quickly in swarming attacks. Now following this line of thinking, we can ask if cyber war and net war have now become conflated in the collective imaginary of the state that the mobilization of military-directed cyber aggression is now equated with organized crime, ethno-nationalist, uh, ethno terrorist groups, and social activist groups and NGOs. If so, then how might a finer grain take on the one club fits all heads trajectory that seems to be in place in the current moment? How can that finer grain analysis that the various targets demand of technological experts make its way into the public discursive spheres or into state policy, and would we wish it to do so? Another key point from Akia and Ron Felt's summary is that net war, they claim, is very effective. Part of this, they, they say, is due to its novelty, that it was just an emergent technology when they're writing and, and, and strategy in 2000. It's, so it becomes kind of, uh, that is, the digital technologies that were being deployed by the military were being co-opted and by corporate uh, sectors were being co-opted and used against them in ways that they hadn't anticipated, which is kind of an ironic blowback of standard military dual-use justification of speculative R&D. Again, we can ask if net war's efficacy has diminished now that in its basic structure, it's no longer novel. And if it remains effective after nearly two decades, why is that so? Can it be attributed solely to technological demands and solutions or is something more fundamental at play? Our panel today offers a varied and complementary set of examinations and analyses of cyber war's many guises in the current moment. We will have papers and presentations that take on information warfare, its primary targets and secondary effects, algorithmic government, governance and activism, face value and bond value undergoing generation, alteration, and decimation in conflicting regimes of truth and rhetoric, asymmetrical resistance in warfare, political hacking, image breaking, identity reconstitution and mobilization, affective domains, and the continued dominance of the two most viable rationalizations of any act or plan that one can use in the contemporary moment, and that is monetization or weaponization. And if you can do one, you've essentially achieved the other. So on that cheery note, <laughs> I will put this over to our first speaker, Svetlana Ativienko, who is Assistant Professor of Critical Media Analysis, School of Communication, Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, BC. I don't have the postal code. Okay, so here's Svetlana. Thank you, Ryan, for this introduction to our panel, and thanks all of you for being here and our wonderful organizers for the interest in this topic. So my talk is Topology of Cyber War, and I will begin with definitions. Hacking and trolling, botnets and viruses, malware surveillance and bugs, shutdowns and blocking and filtering. The internet has become impossible to use. One of the co-founders of Twitter, Evan Williams, offered his diagnosis suggesting that the internet is broken. But maybe it's not. Maybe the internet is finally what is always meant to be. Maybe it's perfect, but not for us, for cyber war. Despite its abrupt coming to public attention, cyber war is a term with more than three decades of genealogy. It has been variously defined often used interchangeably with, and sometimes distinguished from, information war, net war, digitally disseminated propaganda, 
that includes online psychological and virtual uh, political manipulation, fake news, strategic information leaks, and electronic electoral tampering. In our book, In Progress with Nick Dar Wisford, Cyber War and Revolution, we favor the term cyber war over these closed synonyms because it emphasizes the military centrality of digital technologies, pointing back to origins in Second World War and Cold War cybernetics and forward to the new levels of automation likely to characterize all social relations, war making, including in the 21st century. Our project, however, began somewhere else. Four years ago, after the outbreak of protests in Ukraine, we initiated a study of so-called Twitter and Facebook revolutions that kept erupting anywhere from the Middle East, North, America, North Africa, Asia, South America, to the post-Soviet so-called commonwealths of independent states. The status of these augmented revolutions in our project soon changed from the primary object of study to just one among many symptoms of a much bigger systemic process that we call cyber war. We propose to define uh, cyber war as a manifestation of the recurrent technological revolutions by which capital periodically renews itself. For example, as a third industrial revolution, microeconomics revolution, computer revolution, information revolution, or indeed cybernetic revolution. Cyber war demonstrates the latest and perhaps most profound of inconsistencies, typically uh, typical for new types of war. The crepuscular non-identity of being neither war nor peace. Cyber war is essentially a form of hostility that is simultaneously compatible with and cross-cuts officially peaceful relations between states, non-state corporate, revolutionary, and random powers. It may be distinct from, preliminary to, or simultaneous with other forms of hostility, including kinetic use of weapons. Conflicts such as in Georgia, Ukraine, Syria are both conventional wars and at the same time cyber wars that sustain civil conflicts, feed them and nurture their ongoing stagnation for the sake of redistribution of profit and power on and offline. Cybernetic research of the 50s on probability and randomness inherited the re-articulated understanding of the relation between chance and determinism in the 19th century, for example, through the growth of statistical research, when chance was absorbed or, leg or legitimized by determinism as the law of chance. It is in this sense the cyber war is essentially cybernetic autopoiesis of incidents, accidents, and engineered operations that constitute the ongoing production of events and semblances equally significant for its dynamic. Despite the ongoing fear of cyber war, it is often remains unnoticed and, or misrecognized. Uh, it concerns not only the exploits such as uh, of zero-day vulnerabilities, but also attacks on critical infrastructure. And the slide here provides some information about the attack on a uh, power grid in Ukraine, which was completely unnoticed, given even though uh, the power was cut in 103 cities. So people who were left without power had no idea that it was cyber attack. So even those who actually suffered it did not know it was there. So, and that's a kind of really uh, explains something about this new form of uh, hostility and attack, etc. Cyber war is scalable, and so it can be far smaller than their predecessors. Because of the scope of digital networks, a relatively few agents may set in motion large events, and so on the other side, because of the volume of information generated by networks, these actors know a great deal about those they reach out to touch. 
This is what Charles Duncan calls the hyper-personalization of war. The weaponized big data produced by users gives the ability to pick out patterned particularities and to identify surveillance suspects at, at a granular level. War becomes increasingly targeted as it becomes increasingly algorithmic. Our project uh, consolidates two theoretical approaches. We fuse Marxist and Lacanian al analysis, including more recent works on the intersection, Rizek and Dean, and lately Sama Tomsic's wonderful book on capitalist unconscious, to explore how the logic of cyber war objective production is accompanied by a logic of fantasy that functions to repress, distort, and mystify the existing structural contradictions, and that makes the user or cyber proletarian the universal subjective position under capitalism." And they quote Sama Tomsic. The subject is, of course, the Lacanian subject of science and subject of desire. The subject that one signifier or one data point represents for another signifier or data point. The subject that being an exclusion, a division itself, is a searcher which constitute a position that fills in the gaps in the process of accident, in the porous accidental megastructure or the stack the topological mode, model by which Benjamin Bratton recently conceptualized a techno-social institution uh, and a machine for the dynamic architecture of the internet, described as a layered series of terrestrial, cloud, city, address, interface, and user operations. Yet, What's striking here is the limited attention this otherwise comprehensive examination of digital networks gives to that most sovereign of activities, war. This is all the more surprising because, as Bratton acknowledges in a footnote, the modeling of the internet as a stack of techno-social activities was pioneered within U.S. cyber war agencies with very non-accidental strategic agendas. In the following, as, for as long as my time allows, I'd like to briefly sketch four aspects of cyber war enabled by this assemblage that concern the user. Interpolative incitement and surveillance suppression. There is a troubling reciprocity between surveillance and mobilization. On the one hand, Snowden's revelations confirmed that cyber war is a process of prismatic panoptic surveillance, monitoring, profiling, and preemption, blending the mass collection of data uh, with personalized targeting of suspects and enemies, implantating an indeterminate paranoia and political chilling of digital populations. However, what necessitates or even legitimizes this surveillance regime is that cyber war also offers new forms of virtual and non-virtual popular mobilization that some theorists have compared to live a mass of the early modern revolutionary wars. Panoptic surveillance and virtual mobilization are reciprocally related in complex and contradictory ways. It is the potential for subversive mobilization that evokes state surveillance, yet states also increasingly themselves mobilize virtual recruiters, troll armies, patriotic hackers, and social media communities synchronized to national propaganda campaigns to set in motion against their opponents. This double phase of interpolative incitement and surveillance suppression characterizes the gaze of cyber war that together constitute and are constituted by a cybernetic feedback loop. The state or the corporate or the corporation appropriates any revolutionary tactics, exploits, and discourses. It is continuously learning from those who stood against it. Spheric blasphemy. 
In 2011, Eli Parizier brought to public attention this phenomenon of filter bubbles. Since then, the personalized web has been often criticized for producing the pacifying sense of self-conformity and intellectual isolation. After 2011, we have seen how the growing antagonisms within or between these echo chambers have been often exploited by state or random powers that built on the prim prelim preliminary work of at automated segregation performed by commercial algorithm generating consumer profiles, which could be called new identity politics. The, densi the density of these bubbles has been tempered, for example, by infusing them with botnets or troll armies to generate the waves of viral spreading and effective resonance, which is one of the things that we identify as fake news. Here, not so much as a matter of content, but of scope and speed. Besides, as Evgeny Morozov observes, the problem is not fake news, but a digital capitalism that makes it profitable to produce false and click-worthy stories. Cyber war fosters fake news and digital crimes, but above all, it fosters war. Peter Sloterdijk's spheric project of bubble spheres and foams, although written in, late, in the late 90s, early 2000s, may be helpful to address the multidimensionality of these network productions and to differentiate between uh, their simultaneous internal dynamic and modulation. Between the microspheric bubbles of the intimate and macrospheric globes of a historical political world, but also those of Amazon, Google, Facebook, Cineweibo, or Kontakte, uh, there are forms that for Sloterdijk refer to the modern catastrophe of the round world, the spheric blasphemy characterized by the antagonized plurality crucial for echo chambers that undermine the libertarian fantasy of network community. In form worlds, Sloderdijk says, the individual bubbles are not absorbed into a single integrative hyper orb, but rather drawn together to form irregular hills. What is currently being confusedly proclaimed in all the media as the globalization of the world is the universalized war of forms. The Parlette. When Sloterdijk radicalized the understanding of ideology deepening the gap between knowledge and action, he noted that ideology is not a foreclosure of knowledge, but the false consciousness, uh, or, or the false consciousness, but the enlightened false consciousness of modern cynicism. Addressing the phenomenon of user complicity several years ago, it seemed to me that to raise the question of user responsibility and accountability is crucial. Although I still think this question is important, the, uh, the unconscious and therefore visceral and affective side of user engagement clearly extends beyond one's choice or reason within a non-relational network assemblage where the body is colonized or truly snatched by cyber war. By introducing the notion of speaking being, the par lettre, in his later work, Lacan brings forward the physical body that is speaking and laboring in one joint act. The body is the site of discursive production, Sama Tomsic reminds us, contains two side, two aspects, the production of subjectivity and production of jouissance that is as much enjoyable as it is exhausting. Just like labor power becomes commodity in capitalism, so does Jewish sons and communicative capitalism. Where the parallel speaks, it enjoys to death, mortified in a three-way virtualization by cyber speak, by cyber economy, and now by cyber war. But not, only but not only language is put to work, any kind of bodily liveliness detected by sensors becomes the matter of extracting value. 
Antonia Garcia Martinez, who built Facebook FBX algorithm, confirms this corporate vision and says, computation would no longer fill some hard gaps in human workflow process, such as the calculators used by accountants. Humans would fill the hard gaps in the purely computer workflow process, like Uber drivers. Data subject. Although data, always, uh, although data analysis always presents data as subject to us, Lisa Gittleman argues, when every click, every move has the potential to count for something, for someone, somewhere, somehow, we are subject to data. As never before, the dilemma of data subject uh, that Sigmund Bauman and co-authors envisioned as a topological figure of the Mobius strip is obvious today. A user is, at the same time, a global subject, citizen of the world, and a local subject, a citizen of a certain state whose digital footprint is often subjected to radically different regulations and risks. In liquid times, Bauman argued that the irresistible fate of open society is the unplanned and unanticipated side effects of negative globalization that he identifies as selective globalization of traded capital, surveillance and information, violence and weapons, crime and terrorism, all anonymous in their disdain of the principle of territorial sovereignty and their lack of respect for any state boundary. As Bratton reminds us, the accidental megastructure of global governance is able to conveniently execute either debordering or overbordering of the nation states' electronic and other frontiers when it's needed. Striving towards totalization, the cyber war assemblage remains immensely porous and increasingly partial which demonstrates the paradoxical topology as negative globalization. Totalitarian regimes intend to suppress and censor users' expression of opinion so that the only remaining voice is that of the government-controlled media. Neoliberal regimes encourage sharing thoughts, feelings, fears, any kind of data for commercial purposes. One system is imposing on its users the imperative of communicative capitalism, say, as much as possible. Another is silencing them by the totalitarian imperative, say, as little as possible. On the global scale, there are two systems of control, one forcing or enticing users to speak and another silencing them, and they are inseparable. They are two sides of one surface supporting and reinforcing one another. They, con con they constitute the topology of today's cyber war, where the complicit data subject is split between the systems of control and the risks uh, in the midst of cyber battles that extend into kinetic wars. The problem is that it becomes almost impossible to determine where the bigger danger rests. And, but it is already clear today that everything said, and even more so, the unsaid, will be held against us tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Svetlana. We're, we will have Q&A, but we're going to save Q&A for all of the speakers um, and do it at the end of the presentations. So our next speaker is Vladin Jola, who teaches at the University of Novi Sad in Serbia. And he, he is part of the SHARE Foundation, which has a data investigation team called SHARE Lab. And he is going to share with us some of the SHARE Lab work. Great. Um, hi. So I'm, I think my... My talk will be a bit different, and I will be more into like some kind of personal relation with 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 some of the experiences that 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 I had in uh, information warfare, together with trying to show you as much as I can big black maps with a lot of white details. So, <laughs> so the first one it's 
topography of the information warfare, and it's like really fresh, maybe from yesterday. But, but it's based on something that we were like living in the last four or five years, because within the Share Foundation, we set up one little group of, of uh, let's call them experts, um, lawyers, cyber forensics, like data visualization, data analysis people. And our idea was that we should give free uh, support in cases of uh, cyber attacks, mostly on independent media, investigative journalists, this kind of people in Serbia. And first we were thinking this is going to be like, you know, cool and easy job, but then suddenly, like from the first day, we were drawn into number of cases. So in the last four years, I, I think we, we monitor around like 400 cases of different forms of violence that existed. So we were kind of driving, a, you know, a ambulance truck, cyber ambulance truck and trying to <laughs> deal with the, with the problems. And based on this experience, I, I made uh, this map. And so it started on one side, I wanted to, to draw like, what is going on in this imaginary tube, you know, McLuhan style tube from the moment when someone is uh, publishing something to the moment when someone is receiving this information. An answer to this question, it's kind of complex. And it really gives give us an uh, uh, idea how this topology or, or, or topography of information uh, warfare looks like. Because it's starting with the, um, first with the human being, and what we were really noticing, it, like there is even we like to speak about these fancy cyber things. The the lot of attacks on journalists comes on the physical level, on the psychological level, on the level of of beings. You know? Then we have a tools and interfaces. We have personal devices that can be uh, attacked on a lot of different ways. And then we have internet infrastructure, we have data centers, we have a lot of different places. And, and by trying to understand the power in each of those places, it will give us like answer to like who, who is, who participate in, in information warfare. And, and part of this story, it's not just about fake news. It's not just about all of this kind of dominant narrative in the, in the last, year or so. It's about things that we kind of forgotten because we tend to, you know, like just speak about like, uh, uh, you know, fancy problems and, and problems that are like in trend this year, but we tend to forget things from the past. So here we are speaking about, you know, classical blocking, for example, on the level of infrastructure, we can speak about governments blocking, like filtering and so on. A lot of different things that we were speaking in uh, years before. So, um, I will not go into details of each of those steps because this will take us like uh, a lot of time. But, but, but for example, I would like to show you some of the, the, the little like postcards from those, this time of, of like following those cyber um, attacks. So for example, um, this is something that we were like facing really often. And I re really like this graph because it re represents a DDoS attack. In one moment, like our, so it's political, ruling political party in, in our country. They had the idea because they, they saw the internet as a, they, they, they learned how to control the main media, the old style media and so on. But the internet as a, as a field for them in the beginning, it was some kind of like mystery how to do it. And they had like first idea that was like really strange. Like in, in, in the moment when somebody published something on some website, they will DDoS the website. Really crazy idea. Because it, by <laughs> doing that, they were like uh, creating this Barbara Streisand effect. But we were collecting all of those DDoS attacks so we have a collection of pictures like this, and I really like this one because you can see the trace, like, like, you know, like this kind of forensic situation when you're entering into the room and then seeing the blood on the floor. So, 
this is the blood on the floor. Uh, then another, like one of our, my favorite research, it's like we were like knowing that they will do something. And, and in that moment, this, they move from idea of targeting like physical infrastructure, like did they think the, the, the people who think differently to this kind of like uh, uh, flooding the, the uh, online sphere with the comments, this kind of trolling thing. So we set up before election some kind of data collection points. So we were collecting, trying to understand their movements in this space because the idea was to try to, 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 ha to, to find the traces of their activity because and then there were like some kind of leaked documentation about the tools that they were using. So they are basically, they have a portal in which they are receiving the, the tasks and basically they are getting points for what they do. So if you throw this website and then web, this other website, you are getting points for that. So we were trying to follow that, but on the data side, trying to feel how they are entering into the website in the comment fields, commenting, 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 and going out. So this is, for example, the, the footprints that they are basically leaving in, 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 in this space. Um, then, because we understood that they are humans and they make mistakes, so we were then hunting different kind of mistakes that they are making. So, because they are like copy-pasting the same sentence that they got, that they should say. So those are the, the, the black points are, this is the, all the comments in Serbian news sphere. And the black points are the mistakes, the ones that are like copy-pasted for like hundreds and hundreds of times. This is the lazy trolls. So we were trying to understand what lazy trolls are doing. And I also like a lot of different things like battlefield of like data going there and that and, and stuff like this. And uh, so in this topography, so first they started from this kind of deep level of attacks on, 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 on websites and, and people, but more the time was like progressing, more it was going deeper into this kind of algorithmic spheres. And this is some kind of idea how this looks like. So it's basically everything, there is this kind of propaganda, you know, like, and, and then they have like cyber operations who are targeting different things, doing dif dif different things uh, online. And idea, it's like, uh, so you, you are trying to defeat, to, you are trying to conquer each field of communication that there is. First, there is a way how to control content. And it's a long story, but, but basically through the marketing agency, through the, the news agencies, through manufacturing of like portals, blogs, and so on. But on the other side, you are trying to dominate the comment field, the, the voting field, the, all the possible fields that there are open in this, in this ecosystem. So, and, and, and I was thinking a lot why, what they are getting from there. And, and basically in our case, in cases that we were working, they are getting this situation that by uh, investing a lot of, you know, like comments in this field, you are not sure anymore what is true, what is not true. Is this a human being, not human being, political actor, not political actor. And basically by being there and by producing this huge amount of, of information, you are creating uncertainty. So basically by creation of this uncertainty, you are, you are conquering the, the field. But on the left side of this map, we are speaking about the big players, you know, because at the end, all of this need to go through Google, Facebook, and, and other platforms. And so we, we spent some time in, in trying to understand another big black map, trying to understand how this algorithmic layer of all of this looks like. And this really took us, I think, nine months to one year in order to draw this map. And this map represents how our behavior is transformed into profit 
in case of Facebook, but this is also the same, like half of this drawing, half of, of this map is also used for, for, for this uh, um, news feed and other algorithms. So, and we wanted to, to find out, because in all of those cases that we had, we wanted to understand what is the position of someone who is outside of the system, who is not, who, have, who does not have access to data, big data from the source, what is like this investigation methods that we can have in order to, to investigate all of those dark places? And, and in the case of Facebook, we started to collect a lot of types of data, like how they are collecting uh, information about us, how they are, and then on the other side, how they are selling this. What is the, the product, you know? But what's going on in between those those sides is something that is like real, really hard to get. And in order to, to make this uh, uh, drawing, for example, we needed to analyze somewhere around like six or seven thousand publicly available patents in order to understand different parts of this system, how, what different algorithms are doing. But the main problem, even if it's look, even even if it looks that we can understand something that you know it looks like complex and because it's black and, and complex it must be true <laughs> and so but but basically this also it's like really misleading us about the fact that we have no capacity in understanding like most of those processes that are tried to map and also this depth of, of algorithmic uh, uh, process and, and 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 for example here each uh, algorithm each patent belongs to different year and different time and probably they were never together in the one one picture you know so still all of those things that I show you in in last 10 minutes 15 minutes uh, it's also I trapped you into my you know like agenda into my st storytelling about how to represent data. You know? And this is like one of the big problems with, with data representation, because like if someone did it, it knows that it can lie on a lot of different uh, um, angles. So, I, I think I'm done for this one. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> I can show you more pictures. Uh, Thank you, Vladin. We'll have more dark maps later. Um, our final speaker on the panel today is Megan Bowler, who is professor in the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Some of you might have heard her McLuhan lecture that was given, what, two days ago, three days ago? Yeah. So um, if not, then you get to hear Megan now. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, the title of this talk is The Affective Politics of Info Warfare and the Aestheticization of Politics. And this work represents collaborative research in progress with co-author Elizabeth Davis. How do we make sense of information warfare that seeks as Svetlana has written, not so much to persuade an opponent of a particular truth, but to sabotage the very idea of truth. The post-truth crisis is duly characterized by A, the idea that facts have given way to feelings, and B, the resurgence of right-wing extremist politics, which has pulled the rug out from under the liberal status quo institutions so confidently poised at the end of history. While the post-truth crisis comes as a shock to many, with many of us feeling we have a sense that we've never before experienced this uh, degree of mendacity and disorientation, it was in fact described by another earlier theorist of fascism, Walter Benjamin, in his critique of the aestheticization of politics, which he saw rising in interwar Germany and Europe. 
Benjamin developed this critique of interwar intellectual and artistic movements, the likes of Ernst Junger and others, in a context of a new world of technology integrated with man and the violence and trauma of such a world exposed to mechanized death of the First World War. For Junger, who was writing prototypes of fascism that um, Heidegger picked up very strongly, the target of much and who was the target of much of Benjamin's ire, total mobilization describes the profound implications for human life and death created by unprecedented technological innovations evident from the First World War. The mechanization of industry merged with the mechanization of death in a way that shocked Europe to the core. Junger describes total mobilization as, quote, the growing conversion of life into energy, the increasingly fleeting content of all binding ties in deference to mobility. It, quote, expresses the secret and inexorable claim to which our life in the age of masses and machines subjects us. End quote. In conditions of total mobilization, evident at the end of the First World War, he also writes, quote, there is no longer any movement whatsoever be it that of the homemaker, home worker at her sewing machine, without at least indirect use for the battlefield. The feeling that we may have that nothing is safe from big data, algorithmic governance, that our innermost feelings are networked with Cambridge Analytica's psychometric profiling propaganda machine for hire, this sense that only to unplug is safe and that to unplug is impossible reads indeed like a new stage of totalitarian technological realization of Younger's total mobilization. In his 1930 book review, lambasting Junger and others, Benjamin is deeply concerned with the use of technology for its integral role in fascist affective capture of the masses. He writes, quote, the destructive power of war provides clear evidence that social reality was not made to make technology its own organ and that technology was not strong enough to master the elemental forces of society. One may say that the harshest, most disastrous aspects of imperialist war are in part the result of the gaping discrepancy between the gigantic power of technology and the minuscule moral illumination it affords. In contrast to Marshall McLuhan, who wrote that, quote, man becomes, as it were, the sex organ of the machine world as the bee of the plant world, enabling it to fecundate and to evolve ever new form, Benjamin warns against such a happy prosthetic arrangement. Society, specifically as organized by capitalism, is not yet mature enough to incorporate technology as its organ. Careful attention to how the body's relation to technology is at the heart of questions about post-truth and info warfare, which I'm couching in terms of the aestheticization of politics. Aestheticization here does not suggest that politics, politics that are less real, it means deploying new ways of capturing and mobilizing affect. For Benjamin, as for us now, this is a question of paying due diligence to how new technologies of representation, such as social media, capture and mobilize affects. Trump's aestheticization of politics in no way means that he doesn't have very real political effects, but affective politics is the mode of effecting politics. Thus, questions of info warfare need to pay attention to the differential ways that emotions and affect are mobilized and targeted unevenly based on social hierarchies, structures of power, identities, whose bodies are affected, which bodies are being mobilized to affect others, whose face, to reference face value. In line with my colleagues here today, my own research documents this nexus of economic, political, and military interests and the increasingly sophisticated affective techniques producing what I would term network subjectivity. And I think this is where I'm kind of honing in on an area that Svetlana, that you're um, naming most certainly. The affective politics of Infowar reflect total mobilization used by advertisers, ideological interests, and the military 
and the news industry in absolutely similar ways. So, and in that McLuhan lecture, which I think at some point will be available, I've detailed these different modalities and how they use micro-targeting of uh, affects in different ways. But um, they share in that the, these newest techniques of influencing public opinion merge behavioral science with big data, a breakthrough attributed to Kahneman and Tversky, who are seen by many as having developed a theory of mind that rivals any other posited by Western psychology or philosophy. This allows social engineers to understand not only our rational and predictable behaviors, I think as you were referencing, but to systematically predict our irrational ones. So uh, this is from uh, The Guardian writing about a firm that uh, produces viral media, and uh, they described their work in this way. Emotion, quote, is the fuel that fires virality. The stronger the emotion that a Facebook post, tweet, or Instagram story elicits, the further it will be carried by the churning waves of algorithm. People share feelings, not information. Low arousal emotions such as contentment and relaxation are useless in the viral economy. They induce humans to close down rather than open up. If you want to get anywhere in the social media game, you're going to need something stronger. Frustration, anger, excitement, awe. So one form of affective, I'm going to name just briefly two forms of this affective info warfare. One being computational propaganda, which we've heard about, but I think it's worth um, just uh, sharing with you how the Oxford Institute describes this as the assemblage of social media platforms, autonomous agents, and big data tasked with the manipulation of public opinion. This is most commonly associated with firms like Cambridge Analytica, which claims to have personality profiles for every single American. Um, Comprop uses bots to intervene in online debate and strategically target particular groups and particular individuals to create false illusions that a particular truth claim has popular and trending status. And this tactic effectively suppresses rivals, sows confusion, defames opposition, and spreads fake news. And I think, um, uh, you were just showing us some of what that looks like. So one example that we've heard about are the dark posts, non-public targeted advertising through a news feed used by the Trump campaign that engage psychometric data to target black Americans with the message, Hillary thinks black people are super predators. Um, I wanted to just share with you really briefly an example of how the military um, the military is using this. And um, I have a prize for anyone who knows uh, more about this because there's a real limit to what I've been able to find publicly. U.S. military interests in affective politics of media are apparent in the fact that Kahneman's work is considered a must-read for intelligence officers. CIA Directorate of Intelligence Frank Pabetsky has described the use of behavioral science for deceptive practices, a fundamental part of the intelligence officer's trade. In 2011, The Guardian reported that, quote, the U.S. military is developing software that will let it secretly manipulate social media sites by using fake online personas to influence internet conversations and spread pro-American propaganda. So that was 2011. That is the last, one of the last articles one can find about this sock puppetry, as it's called, by the U.S. military. Um, and the U.S. military forced the Guardian to retract their statement that this might be used on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Then, the next, basically the next thing I find after the arrest of Barrett Brown, which we were discussing, um, who was involved in leaks about this kind of information, uh, in 2018, January, the U.S. military has made a public call for bids to produce a new AI tool, one that specifically has the ability to hone in on emotions through sentiment analysis of online media, including text, voice, images, emojis, colloquial phrasing, and various dialects of Arabic, French, Pashto, Farsi, Urdu, Russian, and Korean. Quote, the content will be automatically analyzed for sentiment, at minimum distinguish positive, neutral, and negative emotions, and preferably tell anger, pleasure, sadness, and excitement. It should also have the capability to suggest whether specific audiences could be influenced based on derived sentiment. 
So um, I'm not going to offer more examples of how this affective politics is happening, but they all, all of them, used by the news, by comp prop, by algorithmic governance, advertisers, social media, similarly engage a profit-driven logic of sociality that combines platform politics, attention capture, that's the absolute bottom line, and most significantly for what I'm discussing today, emotional manipulation. The surge of populist white supremacist extremism exacerbated via social media is linked to questions of which emotions stick and what cir which circulate when targeted at specific identities in distinct contexts. The affective politics of info warfare in the US frequently target existing tensions of identity politics, divisions surrounding LGBT rights, white supremacy, anti-fascist, and Black Lives Matter activists. We urgently need theorizations that attend to how identities are emotionally exploited for these political and ideological ends. For example, the, un and an the unanticipated rise of the alt-right begs for critical research on how issues of race, xenophobia, immigration, and misogyny are related to what we term affective feedback loops. To speak of algorithmic governance as an invisible hand fails to recognize that capitalist systems determinedly uphold white supremacy. As reported by The Guardian, Google's search algorithm appears to be systematically promoting information that's either false or slanted with an extreme right-wing bias on subjects as varied as climate change and homosexuality. And I'd recommend a new book out by Sophia Noble on algorithms, algorithms of oppression. The rise of emotionality and affective politics surrounding post-truth has resulted in calls for a return to reason that quickly threaten to reinscribe the powerful binaries of emotion and rationality that already cast a long shadow over political science, media, and communication. In the wake of disinformation panic since the 2016 US election, the new mastheads of the New York Times and Washington Post are subscribe to reason and democracy dies in darkness, respectively. Trump has served as an all too convenient foil against which media advertise themselves as the truth and definitive purveyors of fact and reason. As publics and scholars seek solutions to the epistemological crisis, critical thinking is repeatedly invoked as the cure-all, threatening to re-entrance the Enlightenment project and instrumental rationality. So to close, I want to ask what frameworks might aid us without re-entrenching this binary opposition of emotion and reason? I'll just give you a few clues as to where I imagine us perhaps needing to do this theoretical work. I conclude with one caveat about affect theory and brief directions um, that include a reading of Spinoza alongside feminist politics of emotion which predate the affective term. So the caveat, while affect theory might seem a savior in this story amidst calls to put emotions aside and engage rational debate, contemporary affect studies show signs of a new flavor of Cartesianism. One of the most prominent influences in contemporary affect theory, of course, is Brian Masumi. Masumi's account privileges an aestheticized narration of affect as an autonomous force of vitality and potential. He describes affect as, quote, non-conscious intensity. Affect is reified as having great liberatory potential because it is non-signifying and pre-personal. Masumi opposes this positive conception of affect with a quite negative depiction of emotions as personal, rendering emotions not suitable for liberatory politics in his evaluation. Thus, while he conceives of affect as not ownable and resistant to critique, emotion, on the other hand, is understood as domesticated affect. By positing affect as pre-personal, as a non-conscious, never-to-consciousness, autonomic remainder, he reproduces a conception of the subject split between affect on the one hand and cognition on the other, which captures and domesticates these otherwise free intensities into personal emotions. This romanticized conception of non-conscious yet material affect 
plays a definitive other to that cognitively domesticated emotion. This is what I'm calling the new flavor of cogniv cognition materiality binary. Indeed, this allegedly resistant, always free affect seems to have sparked the increasingly popular scholarly attention to affect as somehow promising an outside of potential. Affect is a promise of escape from the limits of language and ideology. And I'm concerned that this overdrawn distinction between affect and emotion mischaracterizes and polarizes them and thereby relegates emotion to the dustbin of history in this move dismissing two decades of pioneering feminist scholarship on emotion which challenged the rationalist liberal understanding of the subject. So let me conclude with some suggested analytic directions for developing a robust theorization of the networked subject. What if we were to return to Spinoza in search for models that avoid such bifurcation, for starters? Emotions, affects, passions, these are not to be transcended for Spinoza. We are fundamentally these desires. Spinoza distinguishes passions from affects. Passions are affects that are not yet fully understood. Arguably in direct contrast to Masumi's reading, the passion which we come to understand through some sort of cognitive conscious process, even if it is a sad passion, becomes a source of joy. The process of understanding our passions is inherently joyful because it increases our power and activity. Spinoza is interested in a person being the adequate rather than the partial cause of her experience. He wants us to determine ourselves, as it were, to self-direct our activity and passivity, our understanding. Spinoza doesn't advocate particular emotions over others. He does, however, advocate that we seek to feel powerful rather than diminished. Our passivity, feeling diminished, results from not understanding the causes of our passions. And I think you've written on the interpassivity and such, yes. If we don't understand them, our emotions, they threaten to diminish our power. By contrast, our power is increased, as is our joy, by understanding the cause of the passions. As Spinoza writes, quote, an emotion which is a passion ceases to be a passion as soon as we form a clear and distinct idea of it. Spinoza's model of affects, which work in tandem with our understanding, might be fruitfully read as a provocation, alongside radical pedagogical practices, such as those of Paulo Freire, as well as with what I've delineated elsewhere as the feminist politics of emotion, including Sarah Ahmed's understandings of emotions, relationality, and sociality, and how emotions circulate, move, and stick, Hochschild's concept of feeling rules and deep stories, my own delineations of inscribed habits of inattention and pedagogy of discomfort, and Donna Haraway's contrast in staying with the trouble of Eichmann's thoughtlessness with response ability. What characterizes feminist politics of emotion in contrast to affect theory is a political interest in bringing privatized and misunderstood passions to public and collective light, understanding how they are produced in social and relational context, recognizing when and how emotions are a source of power and when and how they are used to keep us in our socially regulated places. Indeed, Spinoza's model of understanding our emotions is a sort of blueprint for feminist consciousness raising practices, the collective sharing and analysis of emotions as a foundation for liberatory politics, practices which, by the way, have recently made a return in the context of horizontal organizing of contemporary social movements. In conclusion, in the context of aestheticized politics and affects engineered to the project of totalizing war, Spinoza's approach to understanding emotions combined with consciousness raising might allow us to resist demands for a return to enlightenment rationality. Let us inhabit these gaps in the binary codes as a means of breaking the circuit of affective feedback loops central to totalizing war. There we go, from Uyghur to Spinoza, all right. Okay, um, now we reach that part of the panel that's called question and answer or Q&A. And so it's incumbent upon you to generate some cues so that they can provide some A's, which in turn will generate more cues in you. And that's how the generative process goes. 
So, um, we're going to open the floor now. There are people lurking around with microphones. Yes, there's one over here. Uh, where are the microphoned lurkers? There we go. Uh, hello. Uh, I'd like to ask Megan Buller uh, about um, uh, some emancipatory potential of emotions in politics. You've mentioned um, horizontal politics or horizontal movements, uh, how they work with emotionality. Uh, but I think we see, all of us see, uh, like limited options of horizontal organizations. And if you see any positive uh, cases or um, in, in non-horizontal uh, politics, in vertical politics, of uh, mobilization of emotions for emancipatory goals. Uh, I don't know, in uh, so-called populism of Jeremy Corbyn or something like that, if, are there any uh, emancipatory movements using uh, social media uh, for some positive um, um, things? Yeah. Thank you. You're, you're asking if there are non-horizontally organized instances. Is, um, wow. Um, I'm sure there are, oh, what an interesting question. I'm sure there's many examples. Um, uh, there's so many examples I can, I mean, what about Me Too, for example, right? That's the mobilization of, of affect whether whether you would cons we consider that a positive example or not um, and whether you're looking for a more uh, structured mode of of politics i'm not sure but uh, uh, that strikes me as one example but i'm not sure that i'm getting entirely what you're desiring i was asking for more structured uh, thing uh uh, like systematic work with, with emotions, as we see corporations and, and states uh, using uh, uh, these tools for cyber warfare, as we uh, see some kind of structured response uh, to that, if it's possible. Uh, so you're asking, are, are there resistance to this targeting, in a way? Using the same tools. Using the same tools. Well, I, I am not aware of any. Um, I know that the next project that I'm interested in doing is to use sentiment analysis and partner with people who are doing that kind of quantitative data analysis to understand um, not the simplistic way that I think that has been used so far to track how emotions move, but to understand how emotions move in context. Actually, yes, I do know of an example. Uh, Stephen um, Kovats, are you here? Um, he was the previous director of Transmedia. He's doing really interesting projects in the South Sudan where they're identifying hate speech um, use and, and phrases uh, that are being used to um, incite violence in communities and then they identify that, those languages and they help people understand in sort of a consciousness raising practice. Um, and interestingly though, then once those are extracted and people understand it better, other, other forces are redeploying those same hate speech terms to incite violence in different ways. So it's a really interesting circular issue. But. Other questions? Uh, there's one over here in the front and there's one standing up in the back. Yeah, hello. My question would be to uh, Vladan Yoler. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, but in your presentation, you showed these wonderful visualizations of troll activity in the Serbian cyberspace. My question is, have you been able to galvanize that research into some kind of a response to this activity on the part of the Serbian government or authorities? Meaning, have you found a way to utilize your knowledge to, to present a pushback to that kind of activity? Uh, our previous uh, research on, on DDoS attacks and monitoring of those cases, that had, I think, much, much more uh, impact because we went to um, 
some organs of European Union <laughs> and presented our research and things like this. And, and, and we felt how this came back because there is then like relation between EU and, and Serbia who want to access EU. And I think some of our, our um, some parts of our monitoring had this kind of impact. This one with the, with the, with the trolls and everything, I don't think that it had a lot of impact because I think overall we we'll, we lost, you know, <laughs> and it's like, Maybe we have a snapshot of our embarrassing moment, but it's it's just like this. I, I I'm not so sure that we in Serbia have like another side to communicate this with. So yeah, unfortunately not. I I guess. Thank you. Snapshot of your failure. I like that. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is for Megan. Um, I was wondering, uh, you sort of ended with, or the, the structure of the talk was sort of the task of theorizing in a new way and um, ending with sort of um, framework of consciousness raising or radical pedagogy. And I was wondering if you can imagine these um, strategies being used on social network platforms to actually sort of um, interrupt or infiltrate the feedback loops that you were speaking about. Um, or if those platforms of engagement are already so saturated with the sort of feedback loops that, that that's not the space for the work to be done. And also um, sort of who, who do we in, engage with in, this task, in these tasks? Do we engage with people that are being um, mobilized by the alt-right? Do we engage with these sort of, um, you know, hyper, vulnerable, hyper-aggressive um, ways of thinking? Um, or is it sort of already a trap, an inescapable trap to engage in those um, networks? Yeah, this is a, a great question. When I think about uh, quite frequently what's possible online versus face-to-face, -face, that old conundrum. Um, and it, it strikes me, I think, um, uh, Zeynep Tufeki speaks about what, what exactly is different in the digital landscape and we all go around and around. What is different? There seems to be something about the speed, yeah? And so the kind of work that I imagine and have practiced myself around this kind of activism or radical pedagogies, there is kind of a, a, a time required for it. There is a back and forth. And um, I almost ended, you know, making some sort of... Um, you know, joke about face to face um, in terms of face value, and and I I took it out because I'm wondering I, I don't know does it have to be face to face? How do we do that work in a slowed down environment? I'm really fascinated with the degree to which the media platforms themselves are producing much of the polarization. Uh, I don't think we know that much about it, and uh, so many of the platforms and the news industry does not want to take any responsibility for their role in the polarization. Um, there's an interesting article today that says that, that as robots become more increasingly the ones taking jobs, will this sort of um, backlash uh, that we're seeing become, become less? Anyway, the question of who do we engage with once we're doing that work, um, I would love to figure out how to, how to I, I said at the other uh, talk the other night, that don't we need like a new Highlander Institute in the States? Maybe I need to move from Canada and help start a grassroots movement where we do this kind of um, grassroots uh, mobilizing, but maybe other folks have ideas here as well. Yeah. I can also um, comment on this. Uh, I think what Megan mentioned, the question of time is very important. And in fact, uh, of course, several questions that were asked are all about what to do or what has to be done. And it's the most difficult question. In our book, this is the last chapter, and it's called What Has to Be Done. And in fact, it's the most difficult chapter to write. And we feel like writing this chapter, we feel we sort of reiterating or engaging with some old discussions about tactics and strategies, for example, that's been for a very long while, but Perhaps it's also very important updating, and particularly in terms of 
time. Time comes in our discussion when we speak about strategies, because tactics, obviously, it's a fast technique of engagement, disengagement, etc. But there is something about time and kind of like even psychoanalytical, uh, psychoanalysis informs very much this situation because do we have this kind of different time now than the time of the machine? And again, thinking of Lacan's notion, the subject of science that appeared uh, with uh, the modern science, basically, that's a question about synchronization. When there was kind of, according to Lacan, the sense of connection to the world was lost, so there were machines to sort of reproduce this connection and synchronize. And today, when this entire, our regime of being with machines, it's very much about synchronization. We have to be constantly being on time with the machines. So I guess it's a question of how do we articulate and what does it mean to desynchronize and to kind of inhabit some other different time in terms of this. And Sarah Sharma's work is really great about this, uh, on, on this account of slowness and what Megan was just was saying, it's again about this. It's maybe some kind of different slowness, some kind of different modulation of time that we can inhabit today, I don't know. Yeah. I wonder if, if you might suggest a, a, a colleague um, here at Transmedia said we need a, a feminist army of bots and maybe you can help us develop, I mean maybe that's what it's going to look like, yeah, or not necessarily, you know, radical army of bots. <laughs> I mean, is that an option? I, I'm, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Because then we are staying in the same the same, same narrative, same yeah. battlefield, and and we need something to, you know, we have a weapons now. It's not not about how and who is going to use those weapons in which scale. So this kind of masculine fight, who is going to do it better and do it more? It, I think we should like try to consider idea not to use that. So to go out from the field, not to stay, because I think that now there is like a three directions from the place that we are now. Like, go to like, Ludist idea of like, going out from the technology space, or we can stay within the space and try to fix that. So this is kind of like EU regulation, whatever, no, no, no. Or we can try to build another space. And this building another space, it's still in, within this idea of techno solutions that Dif different types of, like if it's open, decentralized, open code, then it's good. It, maybe it is, but, but maybe not. So there is like, I, I think those are the three, three directions. But creating like another radical forms of bots, uh, it, it's just, no. <laughs> yeah, that's my point. I don't um, additional questions from the crowd. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Vladan. Um, regarding DDoS, uh, I know that in order to carry on such an attack, you need to have access to lots of unsecured devices, which you can control from some command and control uh, location. So did you ever see any relation, I mean, in the type of DDoS that was carried on and you, that you detected? And I don't know some particular group or uh, of hackers or activists or uh, group that was uh, in relation to that type of DDoS, like uh, the recent, uh, well, not recent anymore, but there was Mirai botnet that could uh, take down half of the internet some time ago. And uh, I'm imagining that actually states kind of subcontract uh, these kinds of organization to carry on these attacks, but the states, I don't think they have the capability or the time to allocate to build such botnets to carry on the attacks. So, like, I'm, I have like a dual relation, like feeling related to DDoS attacks. I, I like them like really a lot from the past time before, when, when for example, this digital Zapatista movement idea of like uh, using a DDoS as a form of uh, uh, civil disobedience. So squatting the server and this kind of like really poetic ideas about DDoS. But today the, it developed in some kind of business 
that is not so easy, it's, it's good because you cannot trace it. This is the business model. So it's really hard to... to and uh, the, the main problem for us uh, in, in that time was that we were not able to connect the, 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 our regime directly with the, with the uh, IP addresses or whatever, because it's, they are not so stupid. No? But, but the, the problem, what we were able to, to, to make connection, it's like correlation that every time when someone published something against government, the website is down. But we were never able to, 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 to go to the source of the, 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 the problem. And I, th I think it's really easy, really easy to rent some uh, bot network for, for that. It's, not, it's a business, no? Okay, I believe we have uh, time for one additional question. If there is one from the floor. Going once. Okay, well on that note, I think we will conclude and I would like us to thank the speakers for a really terrific panel and to do so in the traditional fashion. <laughs>